Thanks, everybody. I know that lectures are not the most exciting thing necessarily, so I suggest that you send the kids out right now. <laughs> Seriously, if you want to get up and if the moms and dads want to stay here and let the kids go and play, that's perfectly OK with me. Don't, don't hang around fidgeting. Go and, go and play now if you want to. Uh, if you feel like you want to wait till after the lecture to play, you can do that too. I'm going to go out there after the lecture and get some of that ice cream because I love that stuff. OK, so this is the hands-on part, and this is the talk. OK, so I was going to tell you about uh, this crazy project I've been working on for a long time. In fact, I've been working on it for more than 10 years. It seems nuts. If you, if you people ask you, what have you been doing for the last 10 years? Oh, I've been working on the shape of icicles. It's like that song about the, the father who's still studying the sealing wax. You know that one? Anyway, uh, this is a serious research project. It was actually the PhD project of Anthony Suhan Chen, who is now teaching in, at uh, universities in Calgary. And it is the PhD project of uh, John Layden. And he and I are working very hard on the, uh, the theory of icicle morphology. But I won't tell you very much about the theory today, because the, uh, the pictures are more fun. Uh, Part of, part of the problem with teach, working on this stuff is that people give you monikers or epithets, you know, and I'm known as Dr. Freeze, so this is me. Actually, it's, uh, it's uh, not me, but. Okay, so this, this re research is motivated by a, a deceptively, simply stupid question, which is, you know, what tells an icicle what shape to be? Well, nothing tells the icicle what shape to be. It somehow decides what shape to be, you know, by, for its own reasons, internally, somehow. And so the process is actually kind of tricky. It goes something like this. How do you make ice? Well, you start with water at zero degrees Celsius, and you remove a certain amount of heat from that water, which is called the latent heat. When that heat is removed, the water turns into ice at zero degrees. So returning, making ice means taking water and removing heat from it. Okay, so ice forms wherever the latent heat can be released from the water. Okay, that's simple enough. And then the heat is, so where's the heat released? Okay, so the heat is released. It depends on how the water flows. So the water is flowing over the surface of the ice, and it's carrying away the heat one place more than another. But wherever the heat is removed, the, the ice will form. So the heat release is controlled by where the water flows. All right, so what next? What, where does the water flow? Well, the water flows depending on you know, what shape the icicle is. If, if you know, the water is flowing over this bumpy, strange shape thing, so how do we know where the water flows? Well, we need to know what shape the thing is. So you see, and that depends on where the ice is formed. So now we have a problem because we're back to the beginning of the question again. So if you start answering this question, you start asking more questions, and suddenly you discover you're asking the first question again. So it's a kind of feedback loop. You're stuck in a, in a loop, in a circle. And so it turns out that this is a kind of chicken and egg problem, which uh, is very common in nature. And uh, it's one of the hardest kinds of problems to solve because it's, it, the, the icicle shape is actually what we call an emergent property. It's not the property of any one of these steps, but the property of the kind of looping around this feedback loop many times. The feedback between flow and shape. The fl flow determines the shape, shape determines the flow, so how do we solve the problem? Where do we start? You can't start anywhere. You have to kind of chase it around and around and, get, and figure out uh, the shape from that. And this is uh, something that's called precipitative pattern formation. The basic idea is this. You have some shape, water flows over it. And then something happens, erosion, deposition, dissolution. In the case of ice, something grows as a result of this flow. And then the shape changes slowly compared to the rate at which the water flows over it. And then you get this funny feedback between flow and shape. And the, the, the key thing is that the shape changes slowly and the flow goes quickly, but it responds to the shape and determines the shape, how the shape evolves. So if you think about it, this is actually something that happens pretty commonly in nature. It's one of the great organizing principles, I like to say, of many natural systems. So if you look at, for instance, a glacier, what, what tells you what shape a glacier is going to be? Well, it's basically the shape of the valley that the glacier is flowing in. Now, what determines the shape of the valley that the glacier is flowing in? Well, the glacier determines the shape of the valley that the glacier is flowing in. So who, who comes first? There's a chicken and the egg kind of problem. And so uh, that's, that makes it an interesting problem. So icicles are, of course, made of water. It's water that's uh, freezing and determining the shape of the icicle. But there are other things which are very similar to icicles, which have some of the same problems with them. Uh, the most obvious one is a stalactite. A stalactite is the thing that hangs from the roof of the cave. And it's sort of a rock, a rock icicle, if you like. In fact, in French, in France French, uh, an icicle is actually a stalactite du glace, an ice stalactite. 
There isn't a word in France, French for icicle. In Quebec, they're called a glaçon, a little piece of ice. But if you say that in France, they say, what are you talking about? What you mean is a stalactite de glace. So these two things actually have the same name in French. But basically what happens in a stalactite is that there's a little bit of dissolved calcium carbonate in the water, and that runs over this shape of this, this rock, this calcium carbonate shape, and a little bit of it uh, deposits there. And it's exactly the same thing as an icicle. Wherever a certain amount of carbon dioxide comes out of the water is where the calcium carbonate goes, and that's determined by the shape. So the whole thing is, is basically uh, the same problem again. The big difference, of course, is that an icicle grows in a few hours. You've all seen an icicle, but a stalactite can take 100,000 years to grow, okay? So that means you can study this one in, in the lifetime of a graduate student, or a professor for that matter, and you can't really study this one in the lifetime of a graduate student or a professor. It's not practical. Okay, icicles actually are very subtle things. Next time we have an icicle, I want you to look at it closely. There are three just different ways that icicles grow. One is the obvious one, is the tip gets longer. As, as the, as at the bottom of a growing icicle, there's a drip of water, which is always there, sometimes falling off, right? Here's one falling off. Uh, the ice right at the tip is just ordinary ice growing into a, 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 you know, a bulk amount of water, not, uh, not a tiny little thin film of water, but lots of water there. And that actually turns out to be fast. So the tip of the icicle grows fast. And the sides of the icicle grow, that's mode one. Mode two is the very thin film of water, oh, so thin you can't even really see it, flowing over the surface of the icicle. That, that deposits a little bit of ice there. And that causes the icicle to get thicker. And that turns out to be a somewhat slower process. So if someone ever says to you, why is an icicle long and pointy? Maybe they're making a joke, right? Make it a lot. Why is an icicle long and pointy? Well, the answer is real simple. It's the same reason as a carrot is long and pointy, and that is that the tip grows faster than the sides. So if the tip grows faster than the sides, then you get a long, elongated, pointy thing. There's actually a third form of ice growth in an icicle, which is very subtle. You don't really notice it. But in fact, the tip here grows around a drop, which is a few millimeters in size. And in the center of that drop, it doesn't freeze. And most icicles have a little channel of water, like a, like a little pipe filled with uh, zero degree water uh, sticking up inside the icicle. And sometimes you'll even see bubbles and things in there. And there's, so the third form of growth is that this one, number three, uh, the, the pipe slowly fills up with ice, but it's much slower than the other one. So if you ever see a growing icicle with a drip hanging on the end, just blow on it and blow the drip off and see how, how much uh, hollow end there is on the icicle. That's a, a feature of growing icicles that you don't, uh, don't, probably haven't seen or haven't noticed before. Okay, so the fact that uh, uh, stalactites and icicles are similar doesn't mean they're exactly the same. There are some formations that grow in caves like stalactites which aren't anything like that occurs in ice. So for example, if I just have the growth of the tip but I don't have any water running down the outside, then all the water runs down inside this pipe and adds to the end of the pipe, and it just gets longer and longer. That does not happen in ice, but it does happen in, uh, in, uh, in stalactites, and those things are called soda straws. And these long, thin things are called soda straws, and they are basically stalactites which aren't fat. They're just a drip falling off the end and making it longer and longer. Okay, there's something wrong with my, 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 my slides are being cut off here. That looks right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. OK. OK, so there are other cave formations that you may have seen. This thing is called a drapery, and it looks like a, fl looks like a cloth hanging down from the top of the cave. But it's actually made of solid rock. It's not, it's not a cloth at all. And it's formed by a little drip, which runs down the edge of the thing. And it follows the edge, and it drips off down here. And as it flows down this little edge, it leaves behind a little bit of addition to the edge. And that gives you this long cloth thing. And I once gave a talk at uh, MIT about this uh, topic. And I claimed in that talk that this doesn't happen in ice. And the next day, a professor at MIT brought me this picture from the side of his house, <laughs> which shows exactly that. <laughs> so yes, you do see sometimes drapery in icicles as well. Although I guess I'd never seen one or I had no pictures of it. Now I do, OK? He corrected me. <laughs> So the main difference between cave formations and icicles is that icicles form fairly quickly, and they involve heat, and they're more, you know, there's more violent motion around in the air and stuff. 
And in the cave, things are very slow, and it takes thousands of years to grow. OK, so how do you study icicles? I mean, come on. You might think I might take a naturalist approach. I might go out in nature and break icicles off of people's houses and study them. Well, I have done that. But it's much more, uh, you want to you study hundreds of icicles. You want to know what their exact conditions of formation are. So for that, you need a machine, OK? So we built a gadget called the icicle machine. And this is sort of what it looks like. It's a big box covered with building foam, good old pink panther building foam. And inside the box is a little refrigerator that we made ourselves. And here's a camera that looks down a long channel into the box. And there's a slot in the side of the refrigerator that we can see inside of. And the whole thing is cooled by uh, some circulating uh, antifreeze. And then uh, the computer controls all the temperature and everything inside the box, puts the water in it at the top. And then you can see the icicle as it grows with the camera. And the, ca and the computer controls the camera. So the whole thing comes down to a computer controlled refrigerator, which automatically makes an icicle. Icicles grow very slowly. It's very boring. So what you need is a computer to do the boring stuff for you. Um, here's Dr. Freeze in his laboratory. This is the other side of the machine. These are the gadgets which produce the cold temperatures. And they basically pump this orange stuff, which is actually Canadian Tire antifreeze, around inside the box here and, and make it cold. We can make it about minus 20 degrees Celsius if we want to. So here's a little movie of, when, of the icicle machine in operation. This is what the camera sees when it looks in the box. So what do we do? We take water at zero degrees, and we drip it onto a little support, which is pointy, so the, ice, so the drip falls off the point. And then if it's ice forms, there's some water that drips off. So we drip that into a funnel, and we actually weigh the water that comes out of the experiment in the funnel. But you can't let the funnel freeze, so the funnel has to be a little bit warm, and the, the nozzle has to be a little bit warm. Now, you may have noticed that the icicle is zipping around, you know, rotating. Why would you want to rotate your icicles? Well, it turns out we're trying to make the world's most perfect icicles, so we want them to be as symmetric as possible around. So for the same reason as you rotate the meat in your barbecue to make all sides of it nicely cooked, we rotate the icicle slowly so as to make all sides of it the same. Okay? Now, it looks in this picture like the icicle is tearing around really fast, but it's actually only rotating once every five minutes. So if you were to look in the, look in the experiment with your eye, you would not even see this thing moving. It's very, very boring. It takes eight hours to go, and every five minutes it rotates like a clock really slowly. Okay? But when I speed it up in this movie, it goes fast. There's another reason for rotating it, two more reasons. One is that we want to know the whole three-dimensional shape of the icicle. We want to take pictures from only one direction. So we rotate the icicle slowly, and we can get the edge. We can pick out the edge of the icicle with the computer at all different rotational positions so we know exactly the three-dimensional shape. So this is like a 3D scanner, if you know what those are. The last reason is even subtler. If you want water to run over all surfaces of the icicle nicely, then you have to put the nozzle off center and turn the icicle around it under it. So the nozzle is actually not pointing at the center, but a little bit off axis like that. OK, this, this movie is uh, of an icicle growing using distilled water. And you see it makes a beautiful, smooth icicle shape. So there's actually a theory. And this is the only equation I'm going to show you. There's actually a theory of icicle shapes. Uh, and I have to, have to admit that actually the theorists got there first. The theorists made a theory of icicle shapes before we did the experiment. So one reason we did the experiment was because we wanted to find out whether the theory was right or not. And I have to tell you that it is partly right. Okay? So believe it or not, there's a theory that says that all icicles are platonic. In other words, all icicles have the same shape. So if I take a picture of an icicle and I, put, I just change the scale of the picture, then every icicle should look the same. And this is the, this is the, the formula for the shape of an icicle. Now, I bet you wouldn't have guessed that formula. It's really complicated, uh, and it's, it's completely not obvious. But it comes from studying the physics of the thing I told you at the beginning of how the shape changes as, as the heat is removed and how the water flows and how the air moves and all this stuff. You put all that stuff together in a, in a theory, and it turns out you can, you can kind of boil it all down to a single shape. And every icicle is supposed to have this single shape. It is called the platonic icicle shape. And this uh, theory was first uh, put together by some guys from Arizona where there are not very many icicles. So they went out on the internet, and they downloaded a bunch of pictures of icicles, and they fit their, they fit their, their, uh, their theory to those. And what do you know, it worked beautifully. Okay. So we set out to test this theory. And so what we did is we, took, we made 200 icicles, hundreds more than they were able to study, and we fitted them. That is to say, we checked whether they matched this funny shape that this was predicted. 
And the good news, the good news is that it works sometimes. There are some icicles which are, uh, to a fantastic degree, agree with this theory of the perfect icicle shape. And so the five best icicles, the ones that fit the best, fit to an amazing degree. And in fact, this is even better because there's only one parameter. And this slope here is not even insensitive to that parameter. So, so how, how they could fit so perfectly without the theory being having something right about it is hard to imagine. But that's the good news for the theory. The bad news is that lots of icicles don't fit at all. They look terrible compared to the, compared to the platonic icicle theory. So the platonic icicle theory is partly right, but there are lots of icicles which go where very different from the supposed perfect icicle. One reason why icicles are sometimes not perfect is that they have legs, they branch. It turns out that some icicles develop a little prong like this, and that prong just grows. And then what do you know, you get multiply tipped icicles. So here's an extreme example with many tips. And you might say, well, how come I don't see these on my house? Well, you do. What you see is multiple icicles on your house, right? You don't just see a single icicle. In our experiment, all the ice has to grow from that single support. There's, not a, there's, no, there's no long eaves trough there for them to grow from, so they all have to grow from one place. So this is like a multiply tipped icicle. And it turns out, here's a good example of one, it turns out that air motion matters. The theory actually says that perfect icicles should grow when the air is still. So we make the air still in the box, and we get icicles with multiple tips. So the theory doesn't predict icicles with multiple tips. If you stir the air in the box violently with fans, then the multiple tips go away. So that's one clue. Another clue is that this angle right here, that the tip comes, the extra tip comes out, is often at 60 degrees. You know, that's the angle of a snowflake. So there's something going on in the, in the ice crystal structure, which is giving it some, multiple tips. And that happens when the air is not stirred. Now, you're going to ask me, why do I have to stir the air? Well, the answer is, we don't know. We just did it, and that's what happens. That's why you do experiments, right, to find out these things. OK, so now we're going to stir the air so we don't get multiple tips. The next problem is, if you don't use pure water, the icicles are very non-ideal. So here's two icicles grown identically, same temperature, same flow rate, same everything. And this one is a nice, smooth, almost platonic one. And this one looks like a bad carrot, OK? It's got ripples. It's got kind of fat at the top and skinny at the end. It doesn't look right at all. What's the difference? Well, this one was grown from Toronto tap water. Now, I don't want to say anything against Toronto tap water. It's actually extremely good. In fact, it's extremely close to distilled water. We thought when we started the experiment that it wasn't going to make any difference if we used tap water or distilled water, because the freezing point and all this stuff is almost exactly the same. But it turns out that even a tiny, tiny little bit of impurities in the water, like tap water has, is enough to change the whole shape of the icicle. So it turns out that the most important thing that determines whether an icicle is ideal or platonic or not is how pure is the water. So the ones I was just showing you were all done with distilled water. But if you go away from distilled water, put a tiny bit of, of dirt in your water, then you discover that the icicles aren't uh, platonic at all. And they have this interesting feature, which these ones don't have which is that they're bumpy, they're ripply. And everybody who's seen an icicle, you're all good Canadians, you've all seen icicles, right? You've noticed that some of them have this kind of shape to them, right? But not all of them. OK, so here's, uh, here's the experiment running with tap water. And now I'm doing a different thing with the, with the movie. I'm animating uh, just one point of view and then the next one. OK, so this is the same icicle growing eight times, but from eight different rotational positions. So now you can see very clearly how the ripples appear and move as the thing grows. OK? So you can watch this over and over again, and it's kind of mesmerizing. But eventually, you'll, you can sort of see how the uh, shape changes. So let's talk about icicle ripples. Icicle ripples turn out to be very interesting things. Um, these are three pictures of icicle ripples. That, these two actually grew myself on the side of my house by accident. And this one I got off the internet from a guy in, in Utah. And uh, this is the nicest picture you can find. If you go on Flickr, if anyone know about Flickr, there are 5 billion pictures on Flickr. So if you want a picture of anything, there's thousands of pictures on Flickr. Here's the best one I've ever found. It also was found, was also off Flickr. And this is a whole bunch of icicles under a dock with light shining through them. And you can see the ripples very nicely. And they, all the ripples and all the icicles look very similar to each other. So what do we know about these ripples? Well. They look sort of like the Michelin Man. They're like bulgy, right? Um, they always have a wavelength. That is to say, the, the size of the ripple is always very close to one centimeter.
People have studied the ripples actually on natural icicles, and that is the conclusion. And this is the natural icicle off the side of my house, and this is a uh, ruler, and if you look, count the bumps down there, you'll find there's exactly one per centimeter. So if you're ever out in the woods and you lose your meter stick, you can just break off the nearest icicle and it's a pretty good meter stick. You can just kind of eyeball those ripples on there. What I've just told you is actually a surprising fact, which is that ripples are not found on distilled water icicles, but they are found on tap water and most natural icicles. And so they seem to depend somehow on the water purity. Meanwhile, in another part of the forest, there are people who study stalactites and stuff. And it turns out that there are ripples on stalactites in other cave formations. And they have a special name in that uh, situation. They're called crenulations. Not crenellations. Crenellations are the little things on a castle. OK, a crenulation is a kind of bump in geology. So this is a crenulation. And it looks almost very similar to an icicle ripple, except this is solid rock. And it's even dry. It looks wet, but it's actually dry. That's my hand. OK, and so they're actually common on cave formations. And even, the, even the drapery thing that I showed you before, if you were really quick and looked at it closely, you'd see there are little, uh, little bumps on there. And so even, the, even drapery has crenulations sometimes. OK, so here's the crucial experiment. We grow three icicles which are absolutely identical to each other, except for one thing, the different water. The one on the left is grown from distilled water. The one on the right, and one in the middle, is grown from distilled water with a tiny little bit of salt dissolved in it. We didn't want to use tap water because tap water's got all kinds of complicated things in it. So we took distilled water and we put in what I like to call a pinch of salt, a tiny, tiny little bit of table salt, sodium chloride. And then we can study the thing as a function of how much salt we add. So if you add a little bit more salt, the, the ice goes, so this one, is, this one looks just like that one except it has ripples and it's bumpy, has, has ripply shape. And if you keep adding more salt, the, the shape gets more and more complicated and the ripples get more pronounced. And then you just start getting these, these, these evil carrot-shaped icicles, right? Now, this is actually just a tiny bit of salt. It's nowhere near the salinity of seawater. Seawater has about 50 times as much salt as this water here. So we're still just a little bit of salt, but it only takes a tiny bit to give the effect, to make the ripples happen. OK, so here's an experiment where we take this icicle here and we detect the shape of it on its right-hand edge, and we spread that out in time. So the line is time traveling along, three hours, four hours. And then we make a color code depending on how high the ripple is. So now you can see kind of visually the topography or the bumpiness of the icicle. These little patches here correspond to these little patches of ripples that appear on the side of the icicle. And we have done this hundreds of times. And we have eight different uh, measurements because we rotate the icicle and we can measure it eight times, actually two edges eight times, that's 16 times per rotation. So every five minutes, we get 16 measurements of the ripply shape. And then five minutes later, we get 16 more. OK, so here's the eight rotational views. This is the same icicle, actually a different one, a little somewhat more bumpy one. This is the eight different rotational views of the same icicle. So you see the ripple pattern is a little bit different from the different views. Sometimes it looks rather smooth. Sometimes it looks kind of complicated with collisions. And sometimes you get lots of ripples. The ripples are always about a millimeter high or so. So now I'm just going to show you a few graphs, but this is what you can do is you can study how the ripples grow as a function of the time. So if you start with distilled water, this is sort of zero. This is the smallest bump we can see, and nothing grows if you start with distilled water. It's bumpy, but the bumps don't get any bigger. If you add some, a little tiny bit of salt, the, bump, the ripples start to grow, but then they reach a sort of maximum size and level off. If you add more salt, they grow faster, and they reach a bigger size. Now you might say, well, how does the ripple size, how does the ripple growing speed depend on how salty the water is? You tell me if it doesn't grow at all when it's pure and you add more salt, it grows faster. How does that go? It turns out to be very, very insensitive to the saltiness. So this icicle here has uh, 10,000 times less, ice, less salt in it than this icicle over here. But this one only grows a little bit faster. So the, the relationship between how fast it grows and how much salt you put in is very weak. We say a logarithmic dependence. So even a tiny, even if, you, even if you put in 10 times more salt, it only makes a tiny little difference on how fast the ripples grow. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why people hadn't noticed this before, is that it's really, really insensitive. It, it, the ripples only grow a little bit faster as you increase the salinity. This is the strange, one of, a couple of the strange results. That the, the wavelength doesn't depend on how much salt you put in at all. If you manage to get any ripples at all, they're always one centimeter, as I told you. So even a really salty icicle still has one centimeter ripples on it, 
compared to one with 10,000 times less salt in it. OK, so that's basically a completely constant line, independent, even though the number on the bottom changes by thousands. OK, so now we're going to do a little citizen science thing. I'm going to answer the question of, do the ripples move? So I want to fix your eye on the icicle on the left here, which is a low quantity of salt. Fix your eye on a ripple and tell me what it does. Does it go up? Does it go down? What do you think? You think it's straight. <laughs> it doesn't move very much. Yeah. Well, the tip goes down, yeah. But look at the bump there. Does that bump move? Well, if you look very closely, it moves up just a tiny bit. OK, so now let's look at this one. This is a saltier one, so it's bumpier. Now look at the ripples on this one. They're much easier to see. Which way are those ripples going? Yeah. Down. OK, so the ripples descend the icicle. Whoops. Ripples descend the icicle if the uh, salt is high. And that one actually has a leg, too, just for fun, OK? All right, so if we study this carefully, the strangest fact about the icicle ripples is that they move. Now, remember that no ice moves. Ice is a solid. What happens is the water runs over the ripple, and it freezes on the top of it a little bit more than it freezes on the bottom of it. And that causes the ripple to appear to move upward as it grows, OK, or downward. So it turns out that if I put a little bit of salt in, I get ripples that go upward. So this is a positive number. If I put a little more salt in, they start to go down. OK, so the ripples sometimes go up and sometimes go down. Now, what about stalactites? Are stalactites ripply? Well, yes, they are. And there's even people who have cut stalactites apart. So this is actually a stalagmite. That's the one that's on the floor of the cave, but it's basically the same idea. And I was over in uh, Okinawa, which is a little island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. I was there visiting there. And there was a person there named Mirona Chirienko. And her specialty is studying stalactites that have been cut in half like this. And you can see the rings, the growth rings, inside the stalactite. And if you look closely here, you can see a few ripples in this shape of this stalactite, this stalagmite as it grows. And if you put a line on there, you see those lines kind of go upward. And that means that those ripples are traveling upward on the stalagmite. So there's some evidence, very, very loose evidence, that the ripples on stalactites and stalagmites also move during their formation. But there's very little data on this. OK, so what are the burning questions? See the burning questions? <laughs> it's good, eh? <laughs> you don't get to use that one very often. Uh, the burning questions are as follows. Why are the ripples always one centimeter in wavelength? Can we explain this? The second question is, why do I need salt or something in the water besides water to make this thing, to make ripples in the first place? And the third question is, why do the ripples go up sometimes and down different times depending on how much salt there is in the water? And are, if, are cave ripples, which look quite similar, are they the same or are they just somehow different? Do they go up and down for some? the same reason, or do they have the same wavelength for the same reason? And you're going to ask me, what is the answer to all these questions? Well, for about th five years, we've worked on the mathematical theory of icicles, and the, I have exactly one result to report. We don't know. I can show you books of hundreds of pages of careful calculation, and at the end of the calculation, we don't get the answer. It doesn't work. It blows up, actually. The theory says, infinity! OK, so we don't know. <laughs> the answer to those questions is open. And that's one of the things that makes it really interesting. Here are these things, icicles, we see them every day, and yet we can't explain even the simplest things about them. But we can measure them pretty nicely. So let me tell you a few more things we've done with icicles since we can't explain them. We've got to do something else, right? I took all the data that we generated in this experiment, hundreds of icicles, thousands of pictures, almost 230,000 images of icicles, more pictures of icicles than anyone's ever taken in the whole history of humanity. And I put it all online. Okay? So if you, if you Google Icicle Atlas, you can download all the data. It's an open data source. So that means everything that we use to make those graphs that I showed you, all, all the data we have are all freely available on the internet. And you can look at all of them. So every run of the icicle machine has a little home page like this. And just, it shows you all the pictures <clears throat> and all the derived data and everything from that particular icicle, all the movies all the time-lapse movies that I showed you, and so on. 
So here's a little thing I call the Icicle Rogues Gallery. <clears throat> you can go to this page, which is on the Icicle Atlas, and you can pick an icicle that you like, and you can click on that picture, and it'll take you to everything you ever wanted to know about that icicle, all the images you want, anything, right? Do, it, do what you want with it. It's all under a Creative Commons license. So that means if you want to make icicle you know, earrings or icicle Christmas cards or whatever you want, you can use this data for whatever you want, as long as you say you took it from the Icicle Atlas on the back. That's all you have to do. Okay? So uh, one of the fun things I've been doing is making 3D printable icicles. So here's a 3D uh, re rendering of an icicle, and you can turn it around in three dimensions. And you can send it to a printer, and you can turn it into a piece of plastic. So I have here a couple of 3D printed icicles that you can look at. This one's white. I'll pass this around, I guess. Here. This one, the white one is made of white plastic. The other one is kind of carrot colored. So don't, don't bite it. Here, just as long as you have to give it back to me at the end, that's all. OK, so these are real icicles that really lived, if you like, a few years ago. And they melted years ago. But we saved their shape. And the computer knows their shape. And so the computer can send it to a 3D printing machine that can make that three-dimensional shape again. And now here it is, you know, resurrected in plastic. It's a strange fact. Well, I would like to say that this, this research is about icicles, but it's really about research, too. All research is about research. So what do we learn by doing this kind of research? Which, by the way, is sometimes called blue sky research. We do it because the sky is blue. <laughs> Icicles are there. You know, why did you climb Everest? Well, because it was there. Icicles are out there, and every, every feature of an icicle says to me, why, 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 right? OK, so what did we learn? Well, the first thing we learned is humility. <laughs> because even an icicle turns out to be so deep and complex that we don't understand it. So the depth of unexplained phenomenon, even in an ordinary icicle, which we think we understand everything about in principle, but nothing in practice, OK? So even an ordinary icicle teaches us the lesson that every natural phenomenon has an infinite depth to it. And the more you look, the more you see. So the harder you look, in other words, the more careful the experiment that you do, the more you find. And that's a feature of natural systems <clears throat> that cannot be captured by a simple idea often. The more you dig, the more you, the more you uncover. And finally, I would say that experiment is a vastly better teacher than theory. You know, there's, there's, uh, yeah, there's two kinds of people in the world, those who believe in theory and practice. But in theory, theory and practice are the same. But in practice, they're not, right? So the best way to find out something is to make a really good experiment about it and look closely. And you'll always be surprised about what you find at the end. So thank you for your attention. And now we go play, huh? Uh, any questions for so I'm happy to take any questions, but maybe we should let the kids go outside right now. Yeah. Go for it. Publish. Uh, the way gravity comes into the problem is that uh, it makes the water flow down the outside of the icicle. And if you change gravity, the, what happens, what changes is the speed with which this water flow runs down the outside of the icicle. Um, the amount of salt we're putting in is so tiny that the density of the water doesn't change particularly. It does a tiny bit, but not very much. And, uh, and so if you add a little bit of salt, the water's a little bit heavier. But it still flows at the same speed. The viscosity of the water doesn't change. So there's no reason to think that the water flow is changed by putting the salt in at all. And the, the water film is too thin to have the fluid mechanics necessary to produce surface waves. So you don't get surface waves on like the, you do on the ocean. You don't get waves like that on a very, very thin layer of water like that. So all those things are in the theory that we've worked on. And that's, that's the conclusion of, of that part. Yeah. Yes, uh, very, very tiny amount, but yes. It turns out that there's two temperature differences in the problem. One is the temperature difference between the, the water ice surface 
and the surface of the water that's running down the outside. It's actually super cooled the water on the outside of the icicle, but it's only super cooled by a tiny, tiny amount. But if you add a tiny bit of salt to water, you know that it freeze, the water freezes at a slightly lower temperature, right? If you take the concentration of salt and you calculate from the well-known freezing point depression, it's called, if you calculate the, how much does the water, how, how much colder does the water freeze as a result of that amount of salt, you discover it's also a very tiny, tiny change in temperature. And it turns out the ratio of those two is about one. So one way to say why does the, why does the thing depend so sensitively on the amount of salt is that the, it's all due to tiny little supercoolings, right? The supercooling due to salt and the supercooling due to this, uh, the supercooling of the water flow. They're both very small, but they're both, you know, comparable to each other. We believe that that is the part of the big part of the answer. Basically, the only place where the salt concentration comes into the physics of the problem is this freezing point depression. So we believe that the freezing point depression is the crucial physics. But that doesn't allow us to doesn't doesn't work in the theory yet. We haven't got the theory to work out to calculate that. Yeah. Did you guys try other yes. Uh, we've tried uh, sugar. We've tried things like copper sulfate and and. Uh, and cobalt chloride. You might know that when you sprinkle salt on your driveway to melt the ice, you can buy this stuff called ice melter, which isn't salt. It's usually a, a chloride of some kind, so two, two chlorine ions. And that actually makes the salt melt faster. So we've tried some of those things. And uh, we haven't done enough experiments to tell you that they're really different from the main thing, but to fir the first blush is that they're the same. They produce the same kind of effect. So even a, sol a sugary icicle has ripples, and the ripples seem to depend on the amount of sugar. And, and so basically, it doesn't depend very much on the identity of the impurity. And of course, tap water has a whole zoo of things in it. And, and we've analyzed Toronto tap water, and I can tell you exactly how much you know, aluminum there is in your tap water and stuff like that. Yeah? We just thought it up. <laughs> Where do you get your ideas from? It's like, wow, that'd be cool. Nobody's ever done that before. Let's do that. People have, oh, there's only a few people who've ever studied icicles before. We are the first people to build a machine to do it. So this is the only icicle growing machine in the world. And we made it. Out of nothing, right? Out of parts. <laughs> yeah. That's a really good question, and the problem is that all the other liquids you might want to try are too volatile. They evaporate too easily. Uh, we thought maybe alcohol or glycerin, and the problem is that it has, to be, it has to be close to room temperature. It has to be something that doesn't catch fire. It has to be something that doesn't evaporate and fill the, fill the lab up with you know, explosive stuff. We have tried uh, ordinary wax, so you can grow waxicles. Uh, but the problem with wax is that it doesn't have a sharp melting in uh, temperature. It softens and then it melts kind of over a broad range of temperature. And so it doesn't really mimic ice that well. So we kind of gave up on wax. Uh, but things like alcohol are too, they make too much vapor and, you know, that's not, a, we can't have alcohol vapor in the lab too much. So uh, there are only a few things that are, that are similar enough to water that you could use to replace water and we haven't really worked on, <coughs> on all of those things. Up there, yeah. Um, have you tried That's an excellent question. <clears throat> you don't have to grow an icicle from a point. You can grow ice on the side of a stick. So what we're actually doing now is ice on a stick, <clears throat> and we use a cylindrical stick first. But a good idea is to use a stick with bumps on it. And then you can force the icicle to grow bumps that are different than the bumps it wants to grow because of the rippling, right? So one whole bunch of research which we haven't done is to machine sticks with different ripples on them <coughs> and grow ice on you know, differently bumpy sticks. And uh, that's not been done. <coughs> well, most of it's determined by the shape of the tip of the icicle itself and not the, the shape thing it's hanging from. Yeah? I haven't got any. Yeah, 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 yeah. D two O is interesting because the, the temperature at which it freezes is different and stuff. Yes, <coughs> but no, we haven't done that. And how do icicles melt? 
That is an interesting question. Uh, if you take a non-Ripley icicle and melt it, ripples do not appear while it's melting. If you take a Ripley icicle and melt it, the ripples disappear first, and then it becomes fairly smooth, and then it melts. So many of the, rip many of the icicles you see on your house have actually grown and melted and grown and melted many times. So if you see a really, really narrow, sharp, pointy icicle, that's one that's been, been melted, right? And then often the weather will turn around and then the icicle will start growing again. So, you know, it's complicated in nature. The weather is going up and down and growing them and shrinking them and stuff. But we've not studied the melting problem very carefully, but there is a group in England that has done what we call the ice lolly experiment. They start with actually a cylinder of ice, which is a simple shape, and they just watch it melt. And it kind of goes into this sort of bullet-shaped thing. And that's an interesting problem. But no ripples are involved in the melting direction. Yeah? I don't know, because we haven't done that experiment. All the experiments we've done are at constant temperature. Uh, in principle, we can tune the machine to go up and down in temperature and grow them faster and slower and do all kinds of things like that, but we've not done any of those experiments. Uh, in nature, that's presumably what happens. The temperature drops quickly and the icicles start to form and that temperature's dropping. And so everything's not stationary in nature, but uh, we haven't tried to mimic that in the lab. Yeah, one more question, then we go play. We don't know, uh, because it's rather limited. The liquids to choose, I was just saying, liquids to choose from are kind of limited. Uh, we, we haven't done uh, organic things because they evaporate too much uh, vapor, and we can't fill the lab for eight hours with, with alcohol vapor. Uh, someone suggested gallium, which is a liquid metal, and it's reasonably close to room temperature melting, but I couldn't afford enough gallium to do the experiment, so we haven't done that experiment either. Mercury is too dangerous to pour gallons of it around in the lab, and the vapor pressure is too high. But no, we haven't done all those things. The experiments are very slow. So you must choose your experiment carefully because you're committed after, you know. If you decide to change, oh, let's change impurities. Well, that's like a month or two of work, right? Because it takes only, you only get one icicle per day. Okay, thanks very much.